Hi, I'm James Dunn. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In Depth, and my guest is Joe Morgart, Vice President of Amundi Asset Management based in Boston. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, James. Great to be with you. Joe, what's the central premise of insurance linked securities, and how long have they been around? Sure. Well, that's a great question, James. So, the central premise of insurance linked securities are they're basically the instruments that allow insurance risk to be transferred to the capital markets in the form of basically fixed income securities. Now, because these are outcome oriented investments, whether an event occurs or doesn't, there is really no correlation to the capital markets. And, uh, and over the last 20 or 30 years, as the formal ILS market has been uh, sort of built and developed, there's four primary transfer mechanisms that the industry has built, but the overall value proposition that was true when the first reinsurance companies appeared back in the late 1800s um, is that the nature of their return is usually very attractive and structurally different than the capital markets. And I think that's something that a lot of investors are really searching for nowadays. So what is the role that ILS play in a portfolio? Is it mainly that diversification, non-correlation play? Well, as I think about investing, there's a, 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 any kind of investment can play one of three roles in a portfolio. It can enhance your returns, it can reduce your risks, or it can diversify those risks. I think ILS can play a role in all three of them, but when most consultants or institutional investors look at the asset class, I think first and foremost, they look at the diversification benefits of it, because again, it's structurally uncorrelated to the capital market. So it doesn't matter what happens to interest rates, spreads, the direction of interest rates, you know, valuation in the capital markets. It's completely independent of that. And so for that reason, it's diversification first, return second. Um, I would put it in that order. So are you really in effect offering that holy grail for investors, which is to be able to own something, the performance of which is totally uncorrelated to the major financial markets? Yeah, I don't think we're necessarily unique in the ILS industry. There's a lot of uncorrelated strategies out there, um, but I think the vast majority of them tend to use either fixed income or equities as the underlying raw material. And then you're relying on either a quantitative or a qualitative or fundamental approach to change the, the risk and return stream associated with that asset class. The beauty behind ILS is the raw material itself is structurally uncorrelated. And what you have to do is think about how you want to diversify within that. So I think when people study correlations in you know, perverse markets over short or long terms, this is one asset class that has really distinguished itself, uh, both in you know, idiosyncratic times as well as over the longer period of time from a correlations perspective. Did ILS, Joe, live up to that non-correlation story in the COVID crash of February, March 2020? Because we often see that where correlation stories or non-correlation stories under severe pressure, the correlations don't live up to what people might have expected because people sell whatever they can? Oh, absolutely. And it's not just unique to, you know, last year. I mean, go back to 2008, really any episodic event in the capital markets where you saw, you know, significant movement, I think ILS demonstrated its value proposition. But if you look specifically at the drawdown period of 2020, uh, you go back to the end of the first quarter, the S&P was probably down about 19%. The high yield bond market was down about 13 and commodities were probably down about 23%. ILS is measured by the Swiss Re cap bond index was basically flat, zero. Um, we fit, we did a little bit better ourselves. 
You then go through the second quarter where most of these asset classes snap back. Um, ILS still was very steady. But at the end of six months, you know, the S&P was still down about three and a half percent. High yield was down about five and commodities were still down about 20 percent. But the ILS, you know, sort of the um, cat bond index was up about one or two percent. So, yes, it did exactly what it was supposed to. And the same thing occurred in 2008 as well, when the capital markets had a very, very challenging period. Uh, ILS performed exceptionally well. What kinds of investors do ILS suit best? That's a great question. I think what we've seen over the years is it's uh, pretty diverse. I mean, you have sovereign wealth funds, you have large pensions, you have endowments, foundations, uh, uh, family offices around the world who have you know, deployed this asset class for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I think it suits investors who probably have a strategic allocation approach to how they think about building a portfolio. ILS is not something that you can really time your entry point into the market. I think you also need a little bit more of um, intellectual curiosity to focus on this asset class because it has a different vocabulary. It has a different way of thinking about risk. So if you're looking for something that fits neatly in a box, ILS probably isn't for you. But I think for those investors who've taken the time and energy to look at it, I think they're usually very handsomely rewarded. Joe, when there's a weather event, do ILS holders have to worry that their bonds aren't holding that risk? Or in effect, do they have to hope that someone else is on the hook for that risk? Well, hopefully not. Um, Because if you think about the value proposition of insurance, and it's not just unique to the type of uh, insurance we do or reinsurance, um, most policies you collect a sufficient amount of premium to offset a reasonable amount of losses and still have an attractive return at the end of the year. Um, ILS is no different than that. As long as you build a portfolio that is diversified by peril, by region, by risk layer, we know that there will always be earthquakes and you know, hurricanes and winter storms and floods, but we're collecting a sufficient amount of premium to offset those in most every year. So do you have to worry about every single event? No. Does it prevent people from doing that? Absolutely not. But I think the investors who look at this pretty closely you know, do understand that just because there's an event doesn't mean there'll be a loss. What place does the ILS asset class hold in the global market and and comparably in Australia? Is is Australia a a user of that to the extent of the other major developed markets? Yeah, you actually, you do see some of the large supers in Australia, as well as some in New Zealand deploy ILS. Um, They're not alone. I mean, we see institutional investors in the Middle East, the Far East, uh, continental Europe, the United States and Canada all deploying ILS. I mean, it is a market that's over $100 billion in size. So it's pretty, um, you know, sizable. And the type of investors who appreciate it are pretty much around the world. Is it really, though, at that wholesale and institutional level and uh, not percolating down to, to give retail investors exposure to this? Well, we've seen it both ways. I mean, I think I think we've seen you know family offices, um, registered investment advisors here in the U.S. Um, and some types of intermediaries use ILS. There are ways to transfer this type of risk uh, into that market as well. But again, it looks the same as it is for the institutional world. So you're not getting a different exposure because you're a, you know a high net worth investor than you would be if you're an institutional investor. So it's a pretty good and broad, diverse investor base, because I think the value proposition is the same, whether you're a a large super or a high net worth investor, you need things that are behaving differently in a world that has, you know, low yields, tight spreads, and the potential for rising interest rates. Your needs are no different than any other institutional investor. So what would need to change, Joe, to encourage increased adoption of ILS in Australia? Is it just that education piece around more sectors and more stratas of the investor market becoming familiar with what it does? 
You know, James, I think you really hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of investing is about education. When I look back at some of the endowments that I've served on over the years, I remember looking at venture capital 25 years ago. It was very foreign and very different. But over the time, I think there's been a significant market acceptance of venture investing, hedge fund investing. And really that came through educating um, you know, plan sponsors, investment committees of the value proposition. You know, as a fiduciary, everything that I invest in has to earn its place in the portfolio. It has to enhance returns, reduce risk, or diversify the risk. And ILS is no different, but I think the educational process of an industry that has a different vocabulary, a different way of thinking about risk, and a different way of reporting risk just takes a little bit of education. But I think we're on that path because in a world of you know, tight spreads, low yields, and potentially rising rates, people need to look differently at their portfolio to make a, a, a total portfolio really work nowadays. And it's fascinating, Joe, to be able to tell that story to retail investors that something like the weather, which quite literally is always happening, or natural disasters, which aren't always happening, but are certainly possible at any time, to be able to mobilize and harness those things and bring them into an investment portfolio and play that role of diversifying and, and, and giving a non-correlated source of return. It's amazing that those sort of things that used to be only at the very, very high end of institutional markets do trickle down and possibly can be used by all kinds of investors. It's, it's a great story of, uh, first of all, a, a, an interesting asset class. And, and, and secondly, the democratization of these sort of uh, tools and techniques. Oh, absolutely. Uh, here in the States, you know, within our capabilities, myself, as well as the other portfolio managers involved, uh, we're investors in our own funds because we understand the value proposition the same needs that I have as an individual investor, plan sponsors or supers have. You have to have a generate a reasonable return for your investors so they can you know, enjoy their futures and their retirements and their livelihoods. Um, ILS is just part of, can be just part of that equation. Thank you, Joe. It's fascinating stuff. This has been in depth, and my guest has been Joe Morgart, Vice President of Amundi Asset Management in Boston. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, James. Really enjoyed it.